Hi, so I'm Alison Hughes from the Energy Research Centre at UCT, and I've got two colleagues here from ERC, that's Tara over there and Bruno, both of which are in our modelling group. Um, just, who's beeping? That's you, Constantine. <laughs> Stop. Um, so, yeah, four research groups within ERC, which are broadly um, in the area of climate change, and that's largely related to climate change policy, and they are by far the dominant research group in ERC, which is um, kind of interesting, because they draw from then the rest of the groups in ERC, which are energy poverty and development, energy efficiency, and ourselves, which are energy modeling and planning. And, and I would kind of always hope that that would be the other way around, that you'd have this sort of policy top of the... Um, of the pyramid and, and everything else being kind of bigger and, and more broad reaching, but with, our, with ourselves it's very much the other way around. And, and it's largely just the way financing, financing works. Um, but yeah, so uh, what I was briefed to do was give you an overview of consumption, which I'm gonna do like a freight train because I've got a little bit too many slides, I think. Um, and then move on to the long-term mitigation scenario process, which kind of underpins I guess the mandate to look into things like a carbon tax in South Africa, which is what, what James is, is gonna talk about. And then a little bit about the outcomes of, of the process. So in the in launching into the overview of consumption in South Africa, um, as Rob has said, we're very energy intensive. We're very coal based, which you can see. The one thing I like about this slide, um, and I feel like I should stroll over there. Um, but we have right at the bottom quite a large portion that says we use a lot of biomass. And, and I think this kind of draws to what we don't know about consumption in South Africa. One of the things we really don't know is how biomass is used in South Africa. Uh, one of the things I really like is that it shows that biomass is transported by people. I don't know how many developed country um, Sankey diagrams would show that as a means of transport of fuel in their country. Um, so. Yeah, we ha we're, we're largely coal dominant. We have coal going into, on the right hand, you can see liquid fuels um, and electricity. And that also distinguishes us from many other countries where we have a liquid fuels base which is very dependent on coal and gas through uh, coal to liquid and gas to liquid plants. So about 70% of our primary energy supply coming from coal, as you saw in the Sankey diagram, lots of coal being exported, but also lots of coal being consumed in, in South Africa. Quite a large reliance also on oil, which is largely imported, as well as uh, a little bit of gas, which is largely imported, and that biomass number is very much up for grabs. It could be half, it could be a quarter, um, it's unlikely to be more. But also when, when South Africa reports what is renewable in South Africa, biomass is very much reported as being renewable fuel, so it pushes up what we think our uh, renewable, perc renewable percentage of primary energy supply is. So, you know, nice number to have in there, but probably very wrong. And then in terms of consumption, also largely um, coal-based consumption within the sectors, industry being a large consumer, but also, you know, here another question mark in our energy balances. There are an awful number of question marks in South Africa's energy balances. So we do some very sophisticated research and modeling based on some, um, based on a lot of time spent trying to really understand how is energy consumed in South Africa. And these are drawn up from South Africa's energy balances, which are drawn up by the Department of Energy, which are not necessarily a good starting point for anybody wanting to research energy in South Africa. Uh, because, as I was saying, you get into the residential sector using a, a large amount of energy. In the residential sector, we're reporting huge amounts of coal use, which are very likely to be wrong, um, given that I think it's something like 1% of households actually use coal in South Africa, and it's, it's a thermal fuel, and it's, um, yeah, anyway, very, uh, very badly reported. But nevertheless, so we've got industry using a large amount of coal use, and as Rob said, coal used... Where's Rob gone? <laughs> uh, yeah, being, uh, driving our energy intensity um, and, and a bunch of energy intensive industries in, in South Africa. And also, as Rob said, the power system being very um, coal dominant. So sort of 85% of capacity lying in coal, but when it comes to actual gigawatt hours of production, a higher, a higher amount of production lying in in coal than 85%, it's somewhere in the early 90s. 
but also we have the only nuclear plant in Africa. Um, yeah, and a bit of pump storage and, and hydro, which is also an interesting. So our hydro is imported electricity, largely, um, and wonderful opportunities for reducing our emissions through imported hydro in South Africa. And then in terms of liquid fuel, most of it coming from crude oil, which is all imported, but also a large amount of gas to liquid and, and coal to liquid in, in South Africa. And then Rob spoke a bit about the structure of the economy, but this really just drawing again to there being a number of energy intensive economic sectors in South Africa, very important for export, um, export earnings. And then, as Rob also spoke about, the sort of where does South Africa lie in the global picture? So he mentioned something like 1.4% of global emissions. But in terms of where we, how we would compare ourselves to other developing countries, we're very energy intensive. Um, in Africa, we're kind of a dominant economy as well as very dominant in terms of um, energy and uh, fuel use. Um, I think Bruno was saying earlier, we have something like 70% of the um, electrical generating capacity in the SADC region. So we're pretty high as well as a, a very dominant economy in the SADC region. And these are kind of all underpinned why we, I think as South Africa we began to worry, we are so energy intensive, we're clearly an outlier in the region. When are people gonna start to look at us and go, you know, what are you doing? And I think that was very much the beginning or the motivation for the long-term mitigation scenario process. So now, launching into what was the long-term mitigation scenario process. Any of you familiar with LTMS? Any of you heard of it before? Okay, so that's kind of interesting because in South Africa we think this was very important and, and it's kind of like a, a global, you know, we're the leaders in, you know, in kind of the world in sort of setting this kind of process going. So it's, it's very interesting that only one person in the room has ever heard of it. But anyway, so the, the main objective of long-term mitigation scenarios was to, um, as it says, ro provide robust, broad-supported recommendations for long-term national climate policy and then also um, develop some kind of platform from which South Africa could begin to and negotiate mitigation reductions because we're expecting that someone is going to turn around and say to us, you need to reduce your emissions. So, so we want to get a head start and, and sort of preempt that and know how we might be able to do it. Uh, the outcome of the process is that we have this cabinet endorsed peak plateau and decline mitigation trajectory for South Africa, which um, was, was a remarkable achievement, actually, given that we are very energy intensive and that we have large industry lobby groups in South Africa who, um, you know, lobby for cheap fuel prices and continued use of, of coal in the country. Um, and then also we have a mandate to begin exploring what policies could we use to reduce emissions in South Africa. So the LTMS process, uh, it was mandated by cabinet in 2006. So as you see from the diagram, we have this cabinet memo and we have the start of the process. And then from then on, we had the building of a scenario, um, scenario building team. And the scenario building team are representatives from industry, labor, government, um, and civil society and others. So fairly large meetings, quite strong lobby groups. And then we have also simultaneously this research process. And it's kind of interesting because this is where Energy Research Center splits, where we have our, our modelers very much involved in the research process and the climate change group very much involved in the scenario building team um, and the whole scenario process. And from there we get a bunch of, of documentation and all the documentation coming out of the process. So the scenario building team approved all the technology information that we included in the research. They, they approved all the scenarios that we included. They approved all background data and they also approved all the documentation coming out of the research. So, so this is very powerful. We have a bunch of strong lobby groups all agreeing to a bunch of data. And these lobby groups sit on both sides. It's we want lots of renewables. It's ESCOM saying give us loads of nuclear. It's um, 
Labour saying this is too much of an effect on the economy, um, to others agreeing that South Africa will have a peak plateau and decline emissions trajectory based on a bunch of analysis that has been done. And from there it went on to a high level group and then it was uh, cabinet approved. So in terms of the research, we had three, sort of broadly three um, modeling processes. There's the energy model, which is by far the dominant modeling process, to um, non-energy modeling on both process emissions and then emissions from agriculture and forestry and uh, other sectors. And then tacked on the end, which was not done terribly well, was an sort of economic analysis of what came out of the energy models. And this is something that we would like to try and improve upon because this is one of the main criticisms, I think, of our work, that uh, social effects were not taken into account enough um, during this process. So as with any kind of modeling, well, with most modeling piece of works, you're looking at what are we consuming now, which we had to do a lot of work to actually get to what are we consuming now. Uh, and then how might this look, how might consumption look in the future? And so the first thing that was developed was a growth without constraints um, growth path for South Africa in emissions. And growth without constraints, we see quite a large growth in emissions. Um, and, and a lot of that is driven by the fact that we're allowing a lot of coal to liquid plants to come in, we're allowing coal use to continue. There's very little effort to improve any kind of um, energy intensity or energy efficiency um, in the economy. And, and then also something which was kind of tricky for us was this, was this view of this current development plans, which, which says, okay, these are the policies that South Africa currently has in place. And a lot of argument as to whether policies which we have in place should or shouldn't be included in growth without constraints. And I think this is, this is sort of also maybe a developing country view of, of life as it is. Yes, we have wonderful policies in South Africa, but not necessarily implemented. And so the decision was to have a growth without constraints without current policies, uh, as if current policies aren't, aren't implemented. Um, and, and I think that's largely a correct view of, of how, things, how things happen. And then what we're heading for is this required by science. And so where required by science gets us is that we're dropping emissions um, slowly to what we think the IPCC is gonna want from us at some time in the future. And, and, and you know, as we all know, I think that's kind of changing. But at the, at the time, that was what we thought was required. So, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to drop this growth without constraints down to required by science, or, um, and what we're landing up with is this peak plateau and decline emissions trajectory. And how we do it is we slowly add a combination um, of mitigation options. Now the model that we used is an energy um, economy-wide model, so it's got both supply and demand in it. And, and it's, a, it's an optimization model, so you, you're saying, um, what is it gonna cost me, or what is at, um, you, you're developing a kind of least cost um, supply demand balance for South Africa in the future. So demand is a demand for end uses, it's demand for heating, lighting, cooling, that sort of thing. It's not a demand for final energy. So you're translating a demand for heating, lighting, cooling through a bunch of technologies into a demand for energy. And then you're translating that demand for energy through transformation processes into demand for coal and oil and gas and, and other fuels. And these wages are acting at all parts of the chain. So you've got wedges on the technology, on the demand side. You might have wedges on the behavior side, which are then affecting your, your end use um, consumption or your end use demands, as well as on the supply side. So you might want more nuclear, you might want to not have CTL plants, um, you might want to go, what if we import hydro? So a bunch of things that, that we're considering. Um, one of the difficulties in South Africa is, I don't know, how's my time doing? Five minutes? Two minutes? Quick, quick, chop, chop. Um, is what, how might development look? And, and I think this is, it's, it's a special challenge. And, and then also in this kind of um, development paths, what government policies are driving how we'd like to see growth happening? So in our economic growth where we hit a 6% growth, well, that's very much not a researcher perspective. That's an agreed by 
um, scenario building team, sort of political perspective almost of what the economy might look like. And then various kind of constraints that you hit in economic growth where you go, well, we have only so many iron and steel, um, tons of iron and steel waiting to be mined. Uh, how might that uh, reduce uh, growth in iron and steel industry, for instance? And then also challenges related to what does the future for different household types look like? Because we have in different income groups, households using energy very differently. Um, how might the energy intensity of sectors change without policy? Uh, what are opportunities for road and rail? Will we even invest in public transport in South Africa? So, so what might we be able to do there? Uh, how will technology transfer look? And things like that. And then you land up from that these bunch of different uh, what we called wedges, which are basically giving you a cost to the economy or a savings for a bunch of different measures that we've implemented. As you can see, there are tons of different measures and then what we also did was sum some of those measures together. And the models that we, that we use allow you to get a sort of combined effect of a bunch of, because these policies aren't in and of themselves additive. A lot of them you need to run together to be able to see what the combined effect is. And also, if, you're on the, if you affect something on the demand side, you are also affecting on the supply side. So what is the combination of demand and supply side interaction in the economy? Um, and we see large potential savings in, um, in industrial energy efficiency, in things like um, changing mode of transport, um, and, uh, and other things. And it's just. And, and then I just added this because this is kind of curious for me as a sort of on the side. So we do all this work and we start with the base year 2003. And one of the criticisms after this process was the method of determining the 2003 base year estimate should be provided. It is understood that this was a projection from the 1994 data based on annual GDP growth. So as scientists, we sort of work from here onwards. And then someone gets hold of our work puts it back into 1990 and draws a straight line on which we are criticized. <laughs> For me, this is an interesting kind of disconnect between the science and the policy, which I, which I only realized the other day. And I think it's a word of caution to anyone kind of doing, doing this kind of work, um, that, uh, that we don't, you know, we butt up against these, these criticisms of our work on stuff that actually is not based on anything that happened happened in reality, but the door is open because someone put a, put a, line, put a line on a graph. I think I'm, I think I'm done.